Aloha Aina, Ano Ai, Valina Kako. Welcome to Free Hawaii News, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation, presenting Hawaiian perspectives on a broad range of topics and issues affecting the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific, and the world. Your hosts for Free Hawaii News are Leon Kaulahau Siu, musician, composer, diplomat, and political analyst, and Hina Le Moana Wong. Kumuhula, filmmaker, cultural and Hawaiian language preservationist, and community leader. And now, Free Hawaii News. Ano ai ki alohe a kakoa pauloa e ko Hawaii nei pai aina mai Hawaii a hiki loa ki o ne o ni ihau. Aloha nui mai a kakou, o au no keia, o kumuhina. And I'm Leon Siu, and we're here with Free Hawaii News. Welcome. I mahalo anu ya oko no ko oko hoki pa anamai a no keia ko kako launa ana mahalo nui e Leon. Aloha kawa. Aloha. During the 2022 session that just ended, the state of Hawaii legislature appropriated one billion dollars to fund projects related to Hawaiians. Out of all of the appropriations that were made, here are some of the highlights. HB 2511, 600 million to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to pursue a multi-pronged approach to eliminating its wait list. HB 3041, in which 328 million was appropriated to settle the Hawaiian Homelands lawsuit this is the Leona Kalima State of Hawaii lawsuit. SB 2021, 64 million to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for a portion of the income and proceeds from the Public Land Trust. And the big one, HB 2024, 14 million dollars for the startup and transition planning costs for the Mauna Kea Stewardship and Over Oversight Authority, which appropriates $350,000 for K-12 public education programs in astronomy-related fields of learning. SB 3357, which provided $2 million in grants to improve Native Hawaiian economic well-being and culture. And HB 1600 State Budget Act includes the following, 10 million for planning and development for DHHL homesteads, 2 million for, to support the mission of Iolani Palace, 38 million to address staffing, recruitment, training, and provide uh, Hawaiian language immersion for stu students, also includes funding for classroom renovations. 2.9 million and 14 positions for the Imi Loa Immersion Program at UH Hilo, $117,019 for the Papahana o Kalona Alternative Learning Program, which provides uh, integrated traditional and cultural education programs, $400,000 for operating expenses for the Kaha'olawe Island Reserve, and $200,000 to support the AHA Moku Advisory Committee. HB 1894. This facilitates traditional Native Hawaiian burial practices by including water cremation in the treatment and disposal of human remains. HB 1768 removes uh, some of the hurdles of the, of, for mahi'ai, for farmers, to obtain water for traditional and customary kalo cultivation. That's a big one. Aye. HB 2466, relating to taro cultivation, tax exemption. And HR 130, apologizing to Native Hawaiian people for prohibiting the use of Hawaiian language in Hawaii schools from 1896 to 18 to 1986. And SCR 121, urging the counties and the state to work with Hua Makahikina and Kumuhula to establish policies protecting Hula. So these were just some of the 
various legislation that was passed in this past session. So um, we're going to be talking more specifically about some of these. This year, we see that this $1 billion, it, there was great effort to place a focus on this and put it out to the media. Mm -hmm. Monies are appropriated on a yearly basis. And so, yes, this is a million dollar, a billion dollars, but it's not out of the ordinary that funds are appropriated for all of the following list of things. Right. So our people must be vigilant. We cannot be complacent. Mm -hmm. We cannot simply say, ah, we have now received money and we can sit back mm -hmm. because that's not what it's meant to do these monies we should perhaps consider to be seed monies mm -hmm. that will help to inspire and promote our people to get more active mm -hmm. and of course depending on their political views um, even if at best that they stay alert and they stay uh, abreast of the current happenings that in and of itself is important and also for those who may be willing and desire to participate in this current system because we can see if there were no advocates whatsoever for the welfare and the benefit of our people, we may not be looking at a billion dollars mm -hmm. this year. We might be looking at a million dollars and then that would be a very different story. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's important, I, I say to each and every one of you who are watching out there, our people can make a difference by being politically involved, politically engaged, and being astute about issues like this and the details that come with them. Uh, that's part of the reason why here at Free Hawaii News, we take the effort to bring this information to you. Yes, and uh, the good thing about this is that we are seeing a trend, and the trend is toward believing what we're saying. And uh, of course, the, the state of Hawaii and the United States, their measure of commitment is, has to do with dollars. Yes. So when we see them actually putting some dollars toward the Vavao, to, toward just the, the Vaha that they're doing, um, we're actually seeing, actually it's, it means a lot more. So, so we are making good progress and we do have to be vigilant. We can't let this be a sign that, okay, we won a battle and then go away. We just started, and and this is a major victory this year, particularly with the six hundred million dollars for uh, DHHL to start using its money, and the three hundred twenty-eight million dollars for the Kalima settlement, because those are real, uh, they're really strong dollars, but they're going toward a real purpose, yes. and and so we're making inroads, and I think that this is a good sign. This is a really a banner year for Hawaiians to have made a turn this way so mm -hmm. that the state is actually putting their money where their mouth is. There is no replacement for our land itself. Mm -hmm. As the words of the song say, and this song is Kaulananapua, they remind us, Aole makoa e minamina ika puukala Okay, a upu ni ua lava mako ika po haku ika ai kamaha o ka ai ina. We, we do not value gold and riches and dollars. We value and we are satiated with the stones, the astonishing food of our land. When we have our land, when we have our natural resources, we can have a better life and livelihood. And we are able to make sure that our people have a home to be in and that we are able to live off of our land and that the relationship that our ancestors had long established before the coming of anybody else here to these shores. They left it to us for not, us not only to care for, but for the land also in turn to provide and care for us. I, I. The latest version of House Bill 2024 in the Hawaii Legislature is being called a huge shift because it appears that HB 2024 
now focuses on what's best for Mauna Kea rather than what's best for astronomy atop the Mauna. It's also a big shift because this bill recognizes that decisions about what happens on the Mauna needs to include input from Native Hawaiians as well as the larger community. Here to explain all of this for us is Noe Noe Wong Wilson, who is a lo longtime kiai or protector of the Mauna. She is also a very well respected Kumu and now Kupuna in our community. Aloha Noe Noe, mahalo. Aloha mai kako. Noe Noe, how long have you been involved in protecting Mauna Kea? And could you tell us exactly what you've done? When I moved here in 1989, immediately understood the controversy that was going on on Mauna Kea because at that time, uh, as I look back in, a, in the history of the Mauna, the first Keck Observatory was, was being built. And subsequently, um, Keck 2 was built in 1996. And I recall taking my young uh, children with me to the hearings and listening and, and occasionally not so much giving oral testimony. I don't think I was mature enough then in the, in the topic to um, want to give oral testimony and stand up in front of a large crowd of people to talk about um, uh, my feelings but more more to I did write testimony and submitted it in the processes that were available to us then and so we watched as the additional observatories got um, got permitted and in the 90s I began working for the University of Hawaii system so became more familiar with the processes attended board of regents hearings that were held on our island um, remember Nainoa Thompson's last meeting uh, where he was the only board member who voted against yet another telescope to be, um, to be built on Mauna Kea. And, uh, and in the meantime, had begun um, by the late 90s, learning and training with the Kanaka Ole family in protocol and um, and. Um, Oli uh, and practices, cultural practices on Mauna Kea. So I've been here for a while. Um, and then also in 2015 and 2014 and 2015, I, I was um, not on the Mauna all the time, but I, I did go up in 2015 and was there on the day that that uh, young people were arrested. Uh, Lanakila was a student of mine early on in his in his uh, career at the at Hawaii Community College. And so we went up to support him and the others and, um, you know, f and did not get arrested at that time, but stood on the front line with the other kupuna and keiki in 2015, the first time that uh, TMT project started to attempt to bring trucks up the Mauna. And then uh, continued our cultural practice with the group of wahine that I'm involved in. Um, to, to do our prayers, our pule, our ceremony on Mauna Kea. And, uh, and then again in 2019, um, when we were called to the Mauna to, to stand in opposition of TMT projects. So, as, uh, so I was one of the 38 kupuna that were arrested that day in July. This past year, I was named to this new... Um, this new process to try and address what what Mauna Kea was all about and how it should be better managed through the Mauna Kea Working Group that was um, created by the House of Representatives. And so I have been involved in that process ever since and continue to be involved. process of consensus consists of Kanaka Maoli and what other kinds of people? Whom are we speaking to? The purpose of the Mauna Kea Working Group was to uh, develop a new management 
scenario that might remove the University of Hawaii as the manager of Mauna Kea. And so the, the Mauna Kea Working Group was comprised of 15 individuals. Um, there were representatives from the Department of Land and Natural Resources, from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, a number of community people uh, who, who came from different islands. And there were uh, there was one representative from the Mauna Kea Observatories. And then there were four members of the House of Representatives. So two of the members were chairs of the subject matter committees that we would expect the, any Mauna Kea bill to be referred to. And then two additional members of the House of Representatives who are Hawaiian and uh, one was Representative um, Stacy Eli from Nanakuli District, and the other one was uh, Representative um, Ty Cullen, who came from the Makakilo District on Oahu. And then um, the others included uh, myself, Antipua Kanahele, um, from, from Hilo area, uh, Shane Nelson, who lives in, in South Kona, and um, Lana Kilamanguel, who comes from the Hamakua side of the island. So Hawaii Island was very well represented. And then uh, there was a young Hawaiian, part Hawaiian uh, woman who works at uh, the Daniel K. Inoue Telescope up in Haleakala. And we actually began in July of 2021, and we were given this task with really no restrictions or no, no roadmap, just, just uh, put in a Zoom room and asked to see what we could come up with and given a timeline. And the timeline was to have a report by the end of the year in the hopes that anything that came out of the report might be introduced in the 2022 legislative session, which is what happened. House Bill 2024 did make it through miraculously. Uh, I will tell you, I did not expect there would be that kind of shift in support at the legislature uh, for something that was generated through this process and something that um, really shifted the way that that government and the, the state should be looking at Mauna Kea. I think what House Bill 2024 did was bring a huge shift in, um, in perspective on what we're trying to protect here. So instead of protecting astronomy, which is what the university is doing or has been trying to do for 50 plus years, House Bill 2024 says, no, we need to protect Mauna Kea. And in protecting Mauna Kea, the decisions about how we protect Mauna Kea needs to include the voice of Native, Hawaii, Native Hawaiians and community, and no longer just the university and their special interests. And that is a huge shift in, in um, attitude from, from the legislature. Why is this final version of House Bill 2024 worthy of everyone's support? I think, um, well, you know, first of all, I, the bill acknowledges and we agree, um, those of us who are on the working group, I believe I can say this on, on all of our behalf, that it's still a work in progress, that while House Bill 2024 sets up the foundation for a new authority, which is called the Mauna Kea Stewardship and Oversight Authority to, to uh, be created and to eventually take over the management of Mauna Kea. And, uh, and that is it's, that's what it does. That's the, the bottom line of what this, this bill does. It, uh, there, it does give a timeline for this to occur. So it's acknowledging that um, we can't expect the university to just turn around tomorrow and walk away, that there, there's going to be a transition period. And so that transition period is uh, going to take, it's, it's 
being given five years, uh, up to five years for this to all occur. And while that seems like a long time, if you've ever worked in government, it really is not a long time. <laughs> it's anticipating that it'll take the first year just to name people to the authority. So I'll get back to that later because I think there's a real opportunity for us community members there. Uh, but it's going to take a year because the members have to be selected by the governor and some of the positions are prescribed and then it has to go through next legislative session through the Senate for them to confirm the members. So um, similar to any board or commission that exists now, it's a very similar process. And so then um, once that occurs, then they have to put some key people in place. And so if you've ever worked in, in the state government or in the university system, that alone takes another whole year if you're trying to hire somebody, you know. And so while they do allow for um, these people to be exempt from civil service, which should speed up the process a little bit, it, it doesn't. It really is a lengthy process just to get people in place. Um, if, if you're so inclined in and you can go on to the state legislature website and open up the conference committee report, there's a table that's part of the conference committee report that really makes it clear of how the transition is going to occur. And so basically, the university remains landlord, remains in place to do the daily management of, of Mauna Kea because there are lots of activities that occur daily, including managing tourism on the Mauna. Um, you know, they're supposed to have a handle on that, although I will agree they don't have rules about that particular issue, and that has always still been a point of contention about um, safety, right? So, you know, when it snows up there, they need to close the roads. So they have rangers. So the rangers work for the university. Um, that's a matter of safety for the public as well as for the people who work up there. Uh, they employ scientists who manage the conservation areas, who keep track of the, the animals, the plants, you know, the endangered species up there to, to monitor them all the time. So there's a whole army of people who actually are working up there on the Mauna, currently under the university system. They will continue that for the next up to five years. Uh, the big difference for them is part of the bill states that that there is a moratorium on the university, uh, there's a moratorium on any lease extensions or renewals or new leases. So that whole part that the university had up to this point been responsible for, and we know they were moving forward with the paperwork and the studies that are required for them to apply for a new lease beyond 2033, right, beyond the existing master lease, um, that, that has been prohibited. And that when the, when the authority is finally stood up fully in 2028, that's how they count five years, um, then the new authority will be the entity that will have that kuleana to grant anything new should they determine that, that they want to. Okay, so, so that in itself, I think, is a huge change. And, um, and so this table tells you that at that time, um, in 2028, once the authority is able to stand itself up and put all of their rules and operations into place, uh, including the transfer of functions from the university to the authority, as far as management goes, daily management, then the university will continue to hold their position as a lessee from DLNR for the master lease till 2033. So they will continue to hold the master lease and they will continue the operation of, I believe, three telescopes that are under their kuleana right now. Um, and during the five years, they will continue the decommissioning of two telescopes that are currently in the process. But 
uh, the, the new authority will have all the authority, all the kuleana to determine what the future looks like on Mauna Kea. If there should be a limitation on the number of telescopes or on the square footage of developed land, if there uh, should be more telescopes decommissioned beyond the two that are already underway, all of those will be the kuleana of the new authority and they can make those decisions in the future. And then they will have the authority to grant the new leases if, if that's the case. And as, as I envision what this bill talks about, it, it's no longer, after 2033, it's no longer a master lease. But again, it's up to the authority, right? They could do what they feel. It, it could just simply be applications from any, any of the existing um, observatories that want to continue up there it would be individual applications that's the scenario in my mind um, but but that is the possibility of what could happen under the authority yeah so those are some of the important things um, so the moratorium or oh, the land so there was big discussion about how much of the land on Mauna Kea should be involved in this what was settled on in the CD1 is is only the existing leases that the university holds. So they already hold a lease for approximately five acres, I believe, around the Halepohaku complex at 9,000 feet. They hold a lease for 11,000 plus acres from the summit down, you know, down a little bit uh, to about 10,000, I think, that, to that area. So that's their second lease. And then they also have a access um, over the Mauna Kea access road. So they have, you know, some access there. So, so whatever the university currently holds is what goes with the new authority. And then the new authority has the ability to determine if they would like to apply. Sorry, my is in the background. If the new authority would like to increase that, that, um, uh, Kuleana, you know, increase the acreage, uh, bring it down to a lower level, which was the Mauna Kea Working Group's proposal is they, that it actually encompassed the land from the Daniel K. Noe Highway all the way up to the summit. So that's from 6,500 feet all the way up to the summit. And so that was not adopted. Like I said, what was the final adoption is the university leases themselves will transfer over. Currently, Noi Noi, why do you think the shift from what's best for astronomy to what's best for the Mauna has now occurred? You know, it's really amazing having gone through this, gone through this whole process with um, with the legislature and and having from time to time watched the legislature legislature or, or participated a little bit in other processes and never really coming out satisfied with, with what went on. Uh, I will tell you, I was very, very surprised to see what was actually considered in the, in the last draft. And, and all I can say is, um, okay, so I'm going to say a couple of things. One is in March, we gathered a number of people came down to the legislature and it was a, uh, a brief respite in the legislative calendar. And we held our AHA, our ceremony that we did when we were on the Mauna in 2019 and 2020. And we took our stand and we used to hold our ceremony three, four times a day on the mountain every day that we were up there for the nine months, right? Some people think, well, that was a lot of beautiful singing and dancing. And others, you know, maybe have, a, have an inkling of the spiritual power of pule and intention. And so when we went to the legislature that day in March and people said, what are you doing? Are you protesting? I said, not at all. This is not a protest at all. We didn't even visit. We didn't even knock on doors. We didn't go into the, the offices. And I think they were still, they had just lifted the, the um, prohibition of entering offices, the general public, you know, had been, the, the legislature had been closed for two years. They had just lifted that 
uh, rule and they were allowing people in if you had masks and if you had had um, vaccine cards. But for us, we went down and we did our aha and we prayed. And people asked me, what is your purpose here? And I said, we are in Pule and we are using our collective spiritual power to pray for all the people here in this building so they make the right decisions. And uh, others can laugh and say that's silly to think that that alone is what made the shift. But I do really believe that that helped and participated in the shift that took place right after that. When people understood the seriousness of what we were we were trying to do. And I think once they got past, once they really got past the 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 fact that we're not protesting, you know, we're not, we never were in your face. We never were. People tell me, well, you know, people are so afraid, the legislators are so afraid of, of all of you. And I thought, why? We're we're constituents, we're citizens were normal people and if you just stop and listen that we actually have a message and if from our perspective if you deliver that message in a way that people will listen to you and not be in their face then maybe you start to open up the doors for communication and so there was a lot of one-on-one calling zooming and submitting testimony that didn't oppose everything, but simply said, please take a look at this issue. Please, you know, look at, at this language. Please consider this. And it's the Pono thing to do. Then it's the Pono thing to do. And I think people got that. I think, I think, um, you know, in many ways, the university was their own worst enemy. And despite the pleas from the community and the warnings that they had been given by everybody, including the legislature, they failed to recognize the changes that they needed to make in order to address what was going on here um, and what the community was saying when we were saying this place is important to us and you need to stop and listen. And so it resulted in... Um, what I will I will say now, the legislature, the the House and the Senate uh, members that were involved in this um, overwhelmingly approved it. You know, there were just a couple people in each chamber that voted against it for different reasons, and um, and I think they heard the community and they said, "You're right, a change needs to occur." And what the working group was able to do was provide them a pathway for that change, you know, provide them with with a plan. And of course, they tweaked it and pulled it and, and, you know, she reshaped it a little bit. But by and large, although, as I say, it's not perfect. And there are things that probably need to be adjusted about it or added to it to make sure that, um, the, the outcome of all of this is what we really want to see um, that that yeah it's passed and and hopefully the governor is going to sign it and it is indeed a new day for Mauna Kea. Ano Leila, a new day for Mauna Kea. Mahalo anu ya oi e noi noi for explaining House Bill 2024 for all of us and mahalo anu ya oi for all that you do and for all that you represent for our people. Mahalo anu. Mahalo. Mahalo. I just recently returned from the United Nations in New York. There are several uh, headquarters for the United Nations. Two major ones are New York and Geneva. Um, over the last two years, the, both of those places have been pretty much closed down for uh, activities, mainly because of the COVID uh, pandemic. But uh, they started to open it up again in New York uh, this past January. I was there. They started to slowly open up. But this last um, last month, uh, in uh, the last part of April or early May, I was in uh, New York and had a very, very good time where we've actually started to pick up where we left off prior to the pandemic. Where we left off was we were speaking to a number of different uh, 
Pacific Island nations, as well as a few other nations, to their representatives, their diplomats at the mm -hmm. UN. Uh, to, we're speaking to them about our situation, which we have been doing for a, a long time now, but we're speaking specifically about something that they might be able to do to assist us in uh, reawakening the awareness and in triggering the, re the restoration of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So, um, so we picked up again on this conversation, but over the years we've also been discussing how we, particularly in the Pacific, can be part of the Pacific Island community. You know, uh, King Kalakaua actually started a, uh, a consortium of Pacific Island nations, so Pacific Island kingdoms, uh, but then it didn't go very far at that time, and then there's been this huge lapse of time when most of the Pacific uh, Islands were uh, under colonialism, and then now they've become independent nations, uh, and, and we're sort of left behind. We're not an independent nation, uh, recognized independent nation yet, but most of the rest of the Pacific is, and so we've been left out of the mix, so to speak, and out of the, our, our, um, uh, our neighborhood, uh, yeah. regional uh, uh, discussions of what's going on in the Pacific. So part of the uh, thing, uh, part of the, uh, what I've been doing at the United Nations has been to reawaken our involvement in the discourse going on in the Pacific about how we, as Pacific Islanders, um, need to be thinking in terms of where we're going as, nation, as, a, na as a region and as nations and as a, uh, a family of nations here in the Pacific. Um, so that was a very big part of the discussions I had when I was in New York. The interesting thing about uh, meeting, I met with a half a dozen Pacific Island uh, ambassadors. Um, and um, usually when you make an appointment with an ambassador, they will give you 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, but you know, you get to the point and you go on. But this time, I spoke with those ambassadors, some of them an hour and a half, and others uh, for an hour, just because we had a lot to talk about with each other. How do we contribute to the global discourse that is going on? The things that are going on around the world that affect all of us, and how can we, as island people, become the ones that that cause a uh, a, a have a voice in how things are going? So, so this is a big part of the discussion. I s we spent a lot of time talking about how we, as island peoples, can affect world events. Um, and then, of course, we talked about our own specific uh, project, um, and that is to uh, work to pass a resolution, well, first of all, to introduce a resolution, and then to pass a resolution with the General Assembly to review uh, Resolution 1469, which was adopted in 1959 by the General Assembly, that actually uh, uh, put Hawaii into a position of being classified as being under the United States, as being part of the United States. So this is something I discussed in an earlier uh, program, but I'd like to report that we are now picking up from where we left off and we are moving forward. And I, I expect within the next few months to be able to report that we have a resolution uh, uh, submitted to the United Nations General Assembly to start to reconsider its decision um, that they made in 1959 uh, that consigned Hawaii, Hawaii into the United States. Minutes, but you know, you get to the point and you go on. But this time, I spoke with those ambassadors, some of them an hour and a half, and others uh, for an hour, just because we had a lot to talk about with each other and to share with each other. So um, in doing so, we talked about not only our situation and what <coughs> we would like to do, but things of mutual concern in the Pacific and how we go about um, not only working out uh, the best route for 
for Hawaiians and for Polynesians, for Micronesians, for the uh, Melanesians to take. How, what direction do we want to go? But the other thing is, how do we contribute to the global discourse that is going on? The things that are going on around the world that affect all of us, and how can we, as island people, become the ones that that cause a, uh, a, a have a voice in how things are going? So, so this is a big part of the discussion. I sp we spent a lot of time talking about how we, as island peoples, can affect world events. Um, and then, of course, we talked about our own specific uh, project, um, and that is to uh, work to pass a resolution. Well, first of all, to introduce a resolution, and then to pass a resolution with the General Assembly to review uh, Resolution 1469, which was adopted in 1959 by the General Assembly, that actually uh, put Hawaii into a position of being classified as being under the United States, as being part of the United States. So this is something I discussed in an earlier uh, program, but I'd like to report that we are now picking up from where we left off, and we are moving forward. And I, I expect within the next few months to be able to report that we have a resolution uh, uh, submitted to the United Nations General Assembly to start to reconsider its decision um, that they made in 1959 uh, that consigned Hawaii, Hawaii into the United States. So that's my report for now. Oh, one other part of it is that for years we have had a small support group of Hawaiians in, in New, who are living in New York now O-E-V-O-N-Y-C. And that group uh, is, has been working very diligently to help to support uh, an awareness of things going on here in Hawaii. For instance, they celebrate Laku Okoa and La Ho'i Ho'i Ea every year and have a small uh, celebration of it, but a, a public celebration so that people come by and ask what's going on. Um, so this group has been uh, very supportive of the act work that I've been doing and others in, in New York have been doing at the UN and amongst the other interna the international community. Um, so this group, uh, however, uh, during the COVID pandemic, or just shortly before, its key leaders of the group decided to move back to Hawaii. And, um, and so the group right now is not functioning at full speed. But I'd like to report that on this last trip, we actually have reactivated uh, this uh, to start up, either start up this group or really uh, start up a new group uh, to free Hawaii. The, and this is um, really good news because now we would have a support base, an active support base in New York. Now, the other part of it is that um, we actually uh, have an office to operate from in New York. And so this has now been reactivated as well. Uh, we, I went to New York and renegotiated for our office, which had been closed for over two years. Uh, so now we are uh, on the verge of, of reactivating the office and becoming ha or having a much more, much more of a presence there in New York. So uh, it was a very successful trip. It's good to be back home. Uh, but we're going to be seeing, uh, I'll, I'll be traveling more as well as others from Hawaii will be traveling more to uh, New York as well as to Geneva as uh, Geneva opens up as well to uh, receive delegations uh, from, our from us as well as from other peoples around the world. So we're making good progress at the Human Rights Council in Geneva and the other human rights bodies there as well as in New York. Here is a provocative thought for us, Kanaka, as well as everyone else in the Paiaina, for all of us to consider. And that is the way our people are viewed and the way we are treated in our own homeland. Mm. And tell me, Leon, do you see and feel these things that I feel where when we look out 
Now, notwithstanding this year where we've just highlighted that a billion dollars has been appropriated. Again, a billion dollars, we are thankful. We're thankful for receiving support. But it is certainly by no means the absolute end. Right, to, it's just a start. Yes, it is just a start. And we all have a kuleana, we have a duty. Mm -hmm. But some of the greater underpinnings of us not only being able to fulfill our duty, but the current government's duty to our people, for our people. And what concerns me is how do our current political and economic leaders and movers and shakers really feel about us Hawaiians? One of the more salient points that we saw in our recent history we saw our entire community rise up. Now, it didn't mean that all Hawaiians went, but there were certainly a great number of us. And amongst them were some of the most prominent in the realm of our culture. That includes Kumuhula. That includes people who teach Olelo, our language. Mm -hmm. And it includes other Aloha Aina patriot people people who love the land, people who farm the land. And Haumana. And Haumana. And this movement was embraced. As someone who just turned 50 years old, Leon. You're a young one. <laughs> <laughs> how old are you? 74. 74. So mm -hmm. how about that? Between your generation and mine. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're my mother's age. And I, I would venture to say here in this program that that's my mom's generation. That's mm -hmm. Your generation told us, the now late 40s and 50-somethings, that we needed to go to school, that we needed to learn our culture, our language, and we needed to do all that we could to promote it, to perpetuate it, mm -hmm. to promulgate it. Because we realized the loss that we had taken yes. by being deprived of that. Yes. Yeah. That's one of the best things in mm -hmm. us working together is yes. that we represent two distinct generations now and we speak to all of you in the audience. Now the only way that we will truly change the perspectives and the attitudes and the approach that has been afforded to our people and all too often we see that the only time it seems that our people are of value is when we can earn somebody a dollar. Yes, I said it. Mm -hmm. The only time that we're of value is when we are generating income for either the current state or for whatever cause that is in front of us at the time. Improving attitudes and improving the treatment of our people require our own people to be even more vigilant. Requires our own people to put ourselves out there. Mm -hmm. We need more people to become the teachers of our future. We need more people in every area of the workforce. We need more people, especially at the political and economic level. And while there will be a great number of us that will continue to work the land, will continue to, to be the fishermen and the farmers of land and sea, we need people to help to promote this and to grow it. We need people to make this a more commonplace reality. Because until we do, and until we take a greater level of ownership, not from the perspective of being a victim, we are victims of our history, but we can't allow ourselves to think that and feel that. Mm -hmm. We have to posture and to put ourselves out there as the leaders of, the rightful leaders of our home. And when we see ourselves as the rightful leaders of our home, we will take greater initiative to make sure that we set the lead, we set the pace, uh -huh. and that we don't ask people, can we, should we? But instead we're saying, this is what our culture reminds us to do. Mm -hmm. This is what are we are obligated to do according to the ways of our people. And I believe that that's how we make these small steps and sometimes great strides in changing people's attitudes and uh, the treatment mm -hmm. of our people in our own home. Again, Mauna Kea was one of the greatest, 
where we saw some of the greatest disrespect shown to our people. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this, Leon? Well, well very good. Um, you know, when we're talking about generations, I am so encouraged by where we started out from 50 years ago, talking about some pilikia we had here in Hawaii, to now realizing what that pilikia is and, and how, uh, we're, we're how we can approach it um, through aloha, kapu aloha, and, uh, and aloha aina, all of these things that grew up or came to life during my generation's activities. Now we have two, three generations, mm -hmm. yours, the one after you, and then one more young, yes. younger ones yes. that are now convinced that this is really the core values of our people, yes. that aloha aina is really core. So when they show up at the mauna, it's not just people showing up for some activity. They actually are expressing something deep within themselves, which, they, which we have we reawakened from our ancestors, from, from where we came from, and that is aloha aina, that love for the land, love for one another, mm -hmm. aloha. So, um, and, and understanding that this can really change things. And this is where our destiny lies, and that is to express the values, the traditions, the, uh, the attitudes, the worldview of our people at, in governing ourselves and moving on toward the future. I really believe that we are in a very good position right now. So this kind of little changes going on in the legislature as far as their attitudes toward us, it's a start, but it's a start in the right direction. Yes, indeed, it's a start in the right direction. And I also believe that it's incumbent upon us to know that we cannot look to others to do for us in the manner that is consistent with what our kupuna would do. Mm -hmm. So standing up for malama aina issues, being patriots who aloha aina, who love the land, being children of this land, our aina aloha. Our land is not only our home, but the land is our mother and it is our mother whom we come from. Mm -hmm. So to understand these things reminds us of the duty. It reminds us of the obligation that we have. But when we acknowledge these concepts and these understandings, it reminds us that we have a duty and that we can't be so fast to just accept being taught that there's a quality of life that we have to aspire to and that it's supposed to be better, but then it takes us away from our home. It removes us from our kulaivi. It removes us from that which is meant to sustain us. Aye. What is Hawaii without a Hawaiian? What is Hawaii without our language, without our culture? So to all of you, my fellow Kanaka, we have seen through many of the most recent efforts, efforts towards aloha aina, malama aina, to, to kia'i, Kia'i not only means to stand up and be guard, but it means to be vigilant. And being vigilant starts with us. Mm -hmm. Being vigilant requires us to develop ourselves one step at a time and to build our understandings and to not necessarily be insular about it either. Aye. We are now a minor minority in our own homeland. And as such, it's important for each and every one of us to take upon ourselves the mantle of stewardship of our land and our culture and our history and make sure that we put ourselves out there to lead, to set the pace, and to be examples mm -hmm. for foreigners and other kama'aina, malihini and kama'aina. We need to set that lead. Yes. And we are on a great direction toward it or we're on the path very much so and so i'm very very uh like i said confident that we are moving in the, the right direction and that this will come to pass as yes. it already is it's already being uh being uh manifested yes very much are. so i polo lay thank you so much for joining us again for another episode of free hawaii news 
Ai, mahalo anui ya uko e na kanaka e na kama aina ame na malihi ni kikai. Mahalo anui ya uko no ko uko ho manawa nui. E ya no kako wahiki mai no i ka ho pena o keia manawa ma Free Hawaii News o maawa no keia o kumuhina lao o lian mahalo anui keia hui ana a hui ho aloha. We hope you enjoyed this month's episode of Free Hawaii News. Mahalo for watching. There's a new show every month, so this program will air several more times this month. You can view it anytime on Olelo's on-demand site or on YouTube. See you next time. Ahui ho, aloha aina. Broadcasting Network.